Today, we'll be talking about the Tat or Tatu. Tatu is the Pali word often translated elements into English. Um, some of you may, may think it's a lot of nonsense. So please listen very carefully. Set yourself to listening as closely as possible. Otherwise, what is said will go past you and it will only seem like nonsense. The word tatu is, well, it's impossible to find a complete translation of this word. The word element we use primarily for physical or material things, but tatu are not limited to the material. It includes mental things and spiritual things. So tatu incorporates, refers to both material and non-material things. The first day we spoke about a new life, which is related to today's topic of tattoo, because if anyone is able of seeing everything as just tattoo, nothing but tattoo, then that will be the same as a new life. That will be a new life. If we see everything as just tattu, then we won't see any of anything, we won't attach to anything as a self or a soul, and there will be no selfishness. Let's recall that selfishness is the most immediate concern we have. It's because of selfishness that all the world's problems, the present world's problems, are derived from selfishness. All the crises, all the innumerable tragedies, are because of selfishness, arise from selfishness. We hold that the, that non-selfishness is the end of problems, that selfishness is the cause of all the crises in the world. Therefore, if if we destroy the self, if we kill it by finding out that it isn't real, that it's only an illusion, then all these crises will be taken care of. So the way to destroy the self or selfishness is to see that everything are, is just datu, Natural datu, that's all. If we uphold a faith or religion that believes in a god or in one god, we are able, to, we limit selfishness by, by focusing, by sacri by giving up to God. Instead of being selfish, we are Godish and oriented towards God. This allows us to more and more give up selfishness. In Buddhism, there is no belief in a personal creator God. The way that Buddhists limit and deal with the problem of selfishness is to realize 
that in reality there is no self to be selfish about. We can do this by beginning to understand and realize that everything is just datu. So the way we deal with selfishness is to realize there is no self, to see that there are only natural elements, natural arising phenomena that just follow the law of nature, and that we, we must live according to this law of nature, and take then we can take this law of nature as our God, as an impersonal God, and more and more orient oneself toward the law of nature rather than orienting oneself towards a self. And in this way, through following living according to, by being oriented to the law of nature, the idea, the belief in a self is let go of. Therefore, the thing we need to see is that there are only these natural datu, nothing else just natural datu, and that nowhere is there any part or portion that is a self or a soul. We need to see and realize this. So please set your minds to this, this task of understanding that there are only natural datu arising and passing away according to the law of nature. So we'll look at the meaning of the word tatu. When we separate and divide things into smaller and smaller bits, the smallest portion or division after this long process of separating and dividing, the smallest portion when we can't divide anymore is a tattu. Now this, this is our usual definition in an, and it works with material things. But with mental phenomena, it doesn't work because mental things are much too fine and subtle. And even more than what was just said. Tat or tatu are both natural things but also supernatural. Tatu are the naturally occurring phenomena and that which is above nature or supernatural. According to the roots, the literary root of the word tatu, it means something that can maintain itself by itself, something that can stand alone or stand by itself, whether referring to natural or supernatural things. Things which are subject to change and impermanence, that is, compounded things, stand in a way appropriate to changing things. And then the supernatural, or things which we can't say, that we probably shouldn't say are changing, these stand or maintain themselves in 
the way appropriate to supernatural things. So changing things, impermanent things, conditioned things, maintain or maintain themselves or stand by themselves in a way appropriate to change. And supernatural, unconditioned, non-conditioned things will maintain themselves in a way appropriate to their the fact that they are not conditioned. So in Buddhism, we ask we ask the apologies for some of some. We have to say that even God is a datu, the God element. God is only a datu. So by seeing everything as only elements, just datu, then we are able to let go of the self. Even that mother instinct of egoism can be seen correctly by, by realizing that everything is only Datu. And in this way, selfishness is done away with also. Now when we look at the word Datu, how many at the beginning we can see there are two kinds of Datu. There are Gaya Datu or physical material Datu, Mano Datu, mm. which is mental or spiritual Datu. Tatu. As far as the the physical datu, we can break them in. We can see four types of datu. The first is earth datu, which is the solid or datu that takes up space. The second is water datu, which is the, the datu of cohesion, of holding together. The third is the fire datu, the datu of, of temperature. And the fourth is air or wind datu, the datu of movement. So these four physical datu appear in all material things, whether they are solids, liquids, or gases. These are the four physical or material datu. Then there is a fifth datu, Agatha Datu, or space Datu, or emptiness Datu. This is the voidness or emptiness that all other, all the physical Datu are founded on, established on this space Datu. Without it, Without a space datu, none of the other datu could could be anywhere, or could be, could exist. The sixth datu is unlike the first five in that it is in no way material or physical. The first five had to do with materiality and physical things. The sixth one has to do with the mind, spirit. We call it vijnana datu, vijnana datu, 
or tattu. It's mental or spiritual. You can say it's the mind or the brain or the heart, whichever you prefer. What we're talking about is what knows, what is aware, what thinks. This is, this is what is referred to by vijnana datu. So if, if all we see are the six datu, then there's no self, selfishness. And when there is no selfishness, there is peace, there is joy, both inwardly, oneself is peaceful, calm, tranquil, and also society around one is also peaceful by only by seeing that all is just Datu, no self, no soul. If you look, you'll see that the goal of all religions is the control and end of selfishness. All religions have this aim and are the same in this way. The only differences are in method. Different religions have different methods of dealing with selfishness, of controlling and ending selfishness. In Buddhism, selfishness is dealt with as we're describing here, by seeing that there is no self, selfishness ends. Other religions have the same goal of ending selfishness, they just use different methods. Another finer, more lofty, deeper, more profound way of looking at Datu is to see three kinds of Datu. The first is Gamma Datu. Gamma is have things having to do with the senses, sensuality, lust, or coarse material, datu. Sensuality or coarse material, datu. Then there is a second kind of datu, which is material, but not associated with sensuality or lust. This is rupa datu, often translated fine material datu. And then there is a third one which is in no way material. This is arupa datu, formless or immaterial datu. All the things in the universe can be seen as these three kind as these three datu or tat I'm <clears throat> sorry in English it's usually spelled D H A T U and so I sometimes say datu in Thai it's pronounced tatu so that's why I <laughs> mix these up the mind can find happiness in the gamma datu, in sensuality and sex. This is one kind of happiness which the mind can experience through, based on the, the coarse material or sensual realm la, datu, or Happiness can be found in pure matter, in fine material datu, such as the, the concentration of absorption through the practice of anapanasati. 
This is a finer kind of happiness based on, on pure matter rather than on sensuality. And then the mind can also experience happiness based on what is not material, what is formless or immaterial, such as the space datu and the, the consciousness or spiritual datu. This is a third type mm. of happiness. Mm. <clears throat> and this, this third kind is a kind of concentration or samadhi which we have not yet studied or looked at. If we look carefully, we'll see that gamma datu, the coarse material datu, can be attached to as a self, as self or soul. And for this reason is dukkha. We can see that rupa datu can also be attached to as self or soul and therefore is dukkha. And arupa datu, formless datu, can also be attached to as self or soul and therefore is dukkha. All of these three datu, if attached to, are dukkha. These three datu or tatu are basis for attachment. We attach to them and they are dukkha. Now there is a fourth datu which is which opposes these three. This is nirota tatu. When their nirota tatu is the the end of the other three datu. The word nirota can cause problems in English. Literally, it means to extinguish, to put out. So, nirota tatu puts out or extinguishes gamma datu, rupa datu, and arupa datu. And in doing so, it extinguishes dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, suffering. We can see that there are two kinds of datu. <laughs> datu that cause dukkha and datu which extinguish dukkha. There are datu which are the basis of, the cause for, lead to the arising or the birth of dukkha, of unsuffering, of suffering or unsatisfactoriness. And on the other hand, there's the datu, which is the extinguishing of this other datu. So there is the datu that causes dukkha and the datu that extinguishes dukkha. There are many different ways of classifying the element, the datu, and so please listen very carefully so that you understand properly. We can also see that there is gamma datu and agama datu. There are many, many different kinds of datu which are associated with the senses that are connected with sensuality. These are gamma datu. And then there are agama datu, datu that are not associated with the senses with, or with sensuality. 
So there is the very many different kinds of sensual dhatu, and then there are non-sensual dhatu, which are rupa dhatu, arupa dhatu, and nirota dhatu, or fine material, non-material, and extinction dhatu. This is another way of classifying the dhatu. We can see that all things are dhatu, even, even that which we call nibbana in Pali or nirvana in Sanskrit. Even this is a dhatu. Sometimes we call it nibbana dhatu or the coolness dhatu. It corresponds with nirota dhatu, the extinguishing of heat, the extinguishing of dukkha. This is nibbana dhatu. So even the highest thing, nibbana, is a dhatu. Everything from the highest nibbana dhatu to the smallest particle of dust or dirt. All these are dhatu. Everything is dhatu. Or to summarize all this in another way, we can see that there are two dhatu. There is sankata dhatu, conditionedness dhatu. All the things that arise and change and pass away through conditions and causes, things that are formed, which pass away, which have beginnings and ends, these are sankata dhatu, conditionedness dhatu. And then there is asankata dhatu, the unconditionedness dhatu. When there are no things, when there is no conditioning, no forming, no causes and effects, the, this dhatu maintains itself without change. It is eternal. So we can see these two dhatu the conditionedness dhatu and the unconditionedness dhatu. All the, everything can be seen according to these two dhatu. And if you fully understand this, asankata dhatu and sankata dhatu, then you will understand everything that there is to know about dhatu. is the same as in the beginning when we spoke of dhatu which, which go according to nature, which proceed according to nature, and dhatu which are above nature, so natural dhatu and supernatural dhatu. The natural ones proceeding, arising and passing away according to nature. The supernatural dhatu is freedom. It is liberation from this arising and passing away. This is a new life, so new that it's, it's, it's newer than new. It's, it's really stretching the meaning of the word new. But the supernatural dhatu, this, which is the base of freedom, of being above natural conditions and conditioning. This is a new life. Now, whether you understand this or not is another matter. Please try to understand it so that you don't see it as all a bunch of nonsense. By seeing that there are 
only datu, that that's all there is, just datu, then, and that there is within all these datu, there is no state or condition of self or soul or some permanent entity, some permanent essence. When we see this, then there is new life. There is understanding of things as they are. This is coolness, and the mind is liberated. It is saved, delivered. You may think that this teaching is very bizarre, that it's strange. And we are quite certain that Buddhism is the only religion that teaches this kind of thing. This is because all the religions which believe in a God and a soul and things associated with the soul are coming from that point of view. Everything is based on and related to, associated with the soul. But in Buddhism, we don't, we don't use that point of view. We come to see that there is no self and no soul. We, we uproot this idea, this concept, this way of perceiving reality, and thereby see that everything is only datu. Now we'll talk about the way of practice to penetrate to the realization of that all is, there is only datu. In practicing the full and complete 16 steps of Anapanasati, we see that in each step there is no self, no soul. There is only Datu. Especially in the 13th step, the contemplation of Anijja, the contemplation of impermanence. Here, all things are seen as impermanent, as ever-changing, as dukkha, and as empty of self or soul. So this is the way to penetrate to this realization. Using the 16 steps of Anapanasati, we can come to this understanding. Or, by developing mindfulness on the movements of the body, raising of the hand, brushing teeth, eating, walking, coming, going, sitting, lying down, through mindfulness of all this, and seeing that all these movements, everything that is happening, are only datu, coming to see that there is no self or soul. See that there is thinking, there is mental activity and mental conditioning because there is mind datu. And there is physical movement, physical activity because there is body datu. And there is emptiness datu. So mind datu, body datu, and emptiness datu are, are going through all these different processes, thinking, movement, the body, the mind telling the body to do things, the body doing things, all sorts of activity, conditioning, forming, passing away, arising, dying. All this is happening now, we, we tend to get really attached to this, this interrelationship between mind datu, body datu, and space datu, or excuse me, emptiness datu. And 
conceive of it as a self or a soul. But when we see that there are just these elements, these datu, interacting, compounding, then we can be aware that there is, in truth, no self and no soul. This is how we can practice in order to come to understand this. Through the 16 steps of, an, of anapanasati or through, and through mindfulness of all the movements of the body and mind. And the most direct way or a very good way of doing this is through the shortcut practice of anapanasati as described in the small book you've been reading. If we approach this in a scholarly or academic way, we can look at the six sense spheres, the eyes and sights, ears and sounds, nose and odors, tongue and tastes, the body and bodily sensations, and the mind in mental objects. There are these six pairs. The eye and a sight interact, and then with the arising of vijnana datu, the consciousness datu, then there is seeing. This seeing, the interaction between eye, sense object, and sense consciousness, or eye consciousness, these are datu. There is, for seeing, there is no need of a self or a soul, of any permanent fixed essence, or just the datu. Hearing involves ears, sounds, and ear consciousness. No self, no soul, just datu. The same with smelling, tasting, sensing, bodily sensing, and thinking. These are happening through datu, and this is all independent of any self or soul. This is another way to look at things. Or we can look at just the external sense objects, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, bodily sensations, and thoughts. We can see these as, as datu, just conditioned things arising and falling away, and that we, we don't have to fall into the problems of liking them or being satisfied with them, meaning that we are attaching to all these things as some unchanging self or soul some unchanging essence. And we don't dislike or become dissatisfied with these external sense objects through and get into the delusion that they are permanent essences. We just realize and perceive that all these are datu, changing, and that there is nothing in them which we should perceive as an essence, a self, or a soul. Finally, there are five things which we can use to see everything. These are the five khanda, the five aggregates. They happen one at a time. There's always one of them 
at work or functioning. So when the body is functioning, is doing its duty, then there is rupa khanda. Or then feeling the mental reaction to sense experience of liking or disliking. This is vetana khanda. And then if if those two, if not those two, well then sanya khanda functions. The recognizing, distinguishing the marks or signs of the sense experience. This, these and that details or characteristics of the experience. Recognizing, perceiving. This is the third khanda. Or sankara khanda functions, does its work of thinking thinking about this, thinking about that, mentally compounding ideas and thoughts, stringing them together. This is the fourth khanda. And if not one of those four, then the fifth khanda is functioning. Vijnana khanda, consciousness aggregate, the clear knowing, the clear clear sensing, clear sharp experiencing. These are the five khanda. They function one at a time. There's always one of them functioning. And this is what is going on in human reality. So we can see that this is just datu. There's no self or soul involved in the process in the functioning of the khanda. In one moment we may be interested in the body khanda, another moment the feeling, another moment recognitions, another moment thinking, another moment consciousness. But there is no self involved or no soul. It's just datu, only datu. So when we see that there are just these natural elements proceeding according to to nature, then there is no disliking or, excuse me, no liking or disliking, no being satisfied with or dissatisfied with things. Because by seeing in this way, by this absence of liking and disliking, then the gilesa, the mental defilements, don't arise. By seeing things as natural datu, then there are not, there's no anger or greed or ignorance. The gilesas don't happen by perceiving that there are only datu. The second thing that happens is that when we realize there's no self, no soul, then there's no burden, there's no heavy weight to carry. By not liking and disliking the absence, through the absence of the gilesa, by realizing that there are only naturally occurring datu that follow the law of nature, then there's no burden to carry around. When we're, li- when we're liking and disliking things, attaching to things as entities, as permanent essences, then we are picking up heavy burdens and carrying them around with us, weighing down the mind. This can be avoided by realizing that there are only Datu. The shortest summary of this is that when there is no more egoism, then there is no more dukkha. 
No, du- we don't cause dukkha for ourselves or for others. The last thing we're going to say today is that this matter is something that is possible. It is a possibility. It is nothing impossible. Many people jump to the conclusion that this is this way of practice is beyond their limits, outside their abilities. And so they're not at all interested in this. Or people have trouble understanding while they listen. And so they lose interest and don't bother to, to do this practice. But the fact is that it's not outside our abilities. It's not outside our limits. The something we are capable of, capable of, uh, capable of. We can realize that all things are just datu, that there is no self or soul. We can let go of these, this attachment to this, this concept and become free of egoism. It is possible to put down the heavy burden of the self, of the ego, and realize a new life. As far as these poss- what is possible, we can talk of three possibilities. The first is that we can understand this matter of the datu, the different classifications of them, the different descriptions we can understand. We can know what they are, how they are. We can study them, come to understand them. This is possible. This is not beyond our abilities. Second possibility is that we can practice this understanding. We can see, we can come to realize that there are only elements, that everything is just elements or Datu. This is the second possibility. The third is to receive the benefits of this realization through understanding that there are only Datu, achieving the freedom from egoistic, selfish, consciousness and thinking. These are three possibilities. These are not far-fetched things which are beyond the means of human beings. These are all possible. So please, please be interested in these. Even the most difficult, most profound thing as far as our understanding goes can still can still be realized. Even Nibbana or Nirvana is something within our capabilities. We can know it, we can be aware of it, we can realize it. The Buddha said that Nibbana is an ayatana. We've heard this word regarding the sense organs and sense objects. Ayatana means something that we can know, that we can be aware of, something that we can connect up with. We can know Nibbana. It is something that is tangible because it is real. The Buddha said we can know it, we can feel it, because it truly exists. So even this most profound thing, this thing which is most difficult for the rational mind to understand, even this Nibbana is within our capabilities. It is not something that we should lose interest in 
because we think it is beyond our means. So don't forget that Nibbana is a tattoo. Nibbana is something realizable and knowable. It is one of these tattoo. And so please take interest in practicing and developing the mind because through development and practice Datu, um, the, niro, <clears throat> the Nibbana Datu is something which can be known, felt, or realized. We can make contact with it. We can get to know it, come to know it, and be aware of it. So, through the practice, developing understanding that everything is only Datu. We can develop and come to realize the Nibbana Datu. The reason which the Nibbana Datu can be known is because it is real. Things that are not real cannot be known. We cannot make contact with them. Anything that is real is something which we can know and realize. Take, for example, God. If God is real, then we can know God. We can make contact with God. We can connect up with God. Since Nibbana is real, we can know it and realize it. We do this through correct practice through understanding properly and practicing correctly, then one can come to know the Nibbana Datu. One can realize reality by seeing that everything is only elements, following the law of nature, that there is no self or soul, This can be realized. We can know it. This has to be santitiko, that which is known and realized within ourselves. Every step, every aspect of the practice is seen and realized in ourselves and by ourselves. It is not dependent on somebody else seeing or realizing for us. To practice correctly, as we have explained, one sees for oneself. One knows and realizes all the various datu up through the Nibbana datu by oneself. In this way, one's understanding is correct and one's practice is proper. Today, we've been talking about the way to meet up with, the way to find and experience a new life. This is the way of practicing in order to know a new life. A new life is real and genuine, and therefore we can know it by coming to understand that there are only natural elements and there is, which are completely empty of a self or soul. In this way, we practice in order to have a new life. This is a distinct possibility within the the capabilities of everyone here. So please be interested in this practice, apply yourselves to it, and receive the benefits thereof. So use this 
way of practice of seeing the elements, the dhatu, as they are, as a means of freeing oneself from the burden of self or soul in order to have or live a new life. And on this note, we will end today's talk. Thank you.